In 2009, I was invited to come to Milan to be at the uh, DMI conference, Design Management Conference, and host a um, workshop on surface design. 2009 was a really busy year for me. I, I do remember because I, I just before the you know like the day before I was in um, Kuopio in Finland, um, where Satu Mitene invited me to uh, do a lecture on uh, design thinking and service design at her her school. Um, and I flew first to Amsterdam for a stopover and directly to Milan and uh, to, to be at the uh, DMI conference. Now, I, I, I expected uh, about 20, maybe, maybe 25 people to attend the workshop. And they, get, they put me in this room. And if you're a facilitator, uh, you, know, you know the situation that, that you know, you specifically around... You know when you you know the service design design thinking uh, when you uh, you know and I, I you know I I plan to do this customer journey mapping exercise obviously I had my pre-printed canvases there and you know I want people to learn by doing so you know I had paper I had pens and the whole thing uh, but the room didn't really have any wall space uh, but I, okay so I'll try to figure it out usually you know we, we either work on tables or on the floor or so I was kind of figuring out how to deal with that. Um, it was a very small room. 50 people came. 50 people came. Uh, I, I, I think more even because I don't think I stopped counting. But it was 50 people in a, in a, in a room that could probably hold 10 to 15 so people were sitting in rows, and so we kind of we gather all kinds of chairs, and there were people standing. And uh, here I here I was, you know, trying to kind of do this workshop um, on journey mapping. So people were working on paper and pen uh, on their laps, and uh, and uh, very cumbersome, but still, um, in hindsight, it was actually quite successful because there was so much interest. You know, now, I mean, at that time, it was totally stressed. And I was like, what's going on? Um, you know, but, you know, now thinking back, uh, it was actually pretty cool. Anyway, I remember that really well. I also remember at, at that conference meeting a lot of people who were interested in design management. And I met, uh, you know, people who are still friends Um and, uh, and, and, and so it's been a very pivotal moment. Now, the guy who invited me, who was the MC for that conference, uh, was uh, Guido Stumpf. And Guido, he's been around, you know, in the world of, of service design and design thinking for as far as I can remember. Um, he's, he's, he's always been there. Um, so I'm really, really proud to have him as my guests today on the show. Um, Guido is, is one of those people that combine, you know, the cre creative mind and the sort of scientific and almost philosophical mind. I, I, I really like listening to him. He, he wrote an amazing book. Um, unfortunately, it is still only in Dutch, but it's going to be translated. I, I'm pretty sure of that, but it's called uh, Radical Change in Small Steps. It's been a bestseller. Uh, it's, um, um, but there's a story behind the book that, that is just as intriguing as the book itself. Because it's a story about resilience and, and, and creativity and creative energy. Anyway, I, I enjoyed the conversation. Um, so um, I hope you do too. So here we go. If I, I uh, would describe myself, um, I, regardless, uh, what, whatever happens, I will always describe myself as a designer. I, I can't help myself and has something to do if I go back in my own past when I was a, a small boy I was already designing but I didn't understand then I do understand now because even at the age of let's say seven or eight years old I'm a little bit older than most uh, listeners probably but I was watching uh, Star, the, the first Star Wars movie ever the number one and the, and and 
most people were collecting items and I was drawing new spaceships because they could be better. I was pretty sure about <laughs> you, that. You were improving? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was the, already the Star, like this. The Star Trek, uh, it's idiotic to have a round uh, shape kind of uh, 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 spaceship or stuff like that. That we can do better than that. And I was doing that already at that age, and I never changed. So, and it took me a long, long time in my life to understand that this particular way of thinking, to 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 to, to look at the world and to start thinking like, hey, we could also do it a little bit differently. And what would it work? Uh, how would it work out? That's that's basically what I'm doing all day. And uh, and I did that my entire life. And I, I worked as a designer and I worked as a marketeer and I worked in communications. I worked in art. But I was always looking with the same kind of eye, like mm. how can we get nice things? For instance, if we take a look at art, what can we put together which will change the original meaning of the, the things apart from each other. Yeah. How could how could we put those things together? But it's always like, what if? What can we do? And and so if if I have to define myself, and it doesn't sound like a very personal uh, guy because I'm also a father. I also have three children uh, who are studying now. Uh, I'm happily married, so I could also start over there. But if I have to define myself, I always say, I was born to be a designer. But it right. took me 20 years before I understood I was one. So, so, it, so you're born to be a designer when you're 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 seven, you're eight, you're designing um, spaceships. Uh, you, uh, so, where did that come from? Do you know? Is it is it is it in your family? Is it uh, is is it uh, is it something that in your is it in your DNA? I'm I'm not sure about that. I, huh? I know that my I have one brother. And he is also remarkably uh, creative in, in, in rethinking, uh, uh, in his case, businesses and education. Mm -hmm. So so in a way, it should be somewhere in our DNA. That's that's possible. I don't know exactly. It's more like... Uh, but your father and your mother, you're, 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 no, no creatives in the family? No, no. I don't have a father or a mother who is, uh, is an artist or something like that. Nothing at all. No. All right. So, so, so were they surprised? <laughs> <laughs> that they do, that they basically created these children. Like, I don't know. I never, from? I never asked them actually. So ah. that's uh, because we took, we took other, uh, uh, I would say, uh, specific things from them that that we incorporated. And I'm not saying that's DNA or that's 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 educated. Uh, uh, how do you say cultivated? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But but my father was was an excellent teacher. He was really, oh. really, really, uh, how do you say, mm -hmm. um, considering uh, students and, and what they need. He was, he was one of the first uh, uh, looking for ways to deal with, uh, uh, how do you name that? Uh, phalanx, I don't know. Anxiety to fill? fill oh, uh, sure, yes, okay, yeah. Blackout, stuff yeah. like that. He was oh. one of the first, first uh, teachers who was actually coaching students, changing this, the, 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 the way how uh, exams are done and stuff like that for those kind of people who have these kind of fears, who have blackouts during exams and stuff like that. So he was really a teacher. Sounds like very, that. very creative to me. In a way, yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. But, but what I was saying a bit more that my brother mm -hmm. and I, we're both nowadays in education and trying to change the face of education. And that's something that we got from the- There from you go. Plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that's not so different, but uh, yeah. So, so, but that's also um, uh, being very empathic, right? So uh, not saying, well, this is just the way it is. Uh, this is how we teach, you know, deal with it, but saying, hey, wait a minute. Uh, they have all these anxieties and they, they so they might, uh, I have to change the way I offer. Well, that's that's a very good observation. Thanks, Arne. Right. In a, in a way, what I what I learned from him and, mm. and, and my mother's a psychologist is always to take uh, the other uh, very serious in what they say and what they do and how right. they think, rather right. than saying he's wrong, you should do it differently yeah. or whatever. It's more like how is how is he thinking? What what does he need? Exactly, which is something that you kind of you kind of took that to design but eventually basically, yeah. 
Yeah, eventually, but it's yeah, exactly right. So, but but so the, the that's that's uh, so that is sort of interesting because it is all about you know empathy and understanding kind of how other people see the world and how they you know experience things, and then and then being able to say also to see hey the way we offer it is actually wrong, so we can change the way we offer things to fit with their needs, which is designing basically uh, and redesigning a system so that's redesigning your the spaceships that's uh, uh, anyway that's where i started yeah yeah so when so where did you go to school where were you born where where was that i was born in uh in 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 in, in the southern part of the netherlands zeeland ah yeah where yeah. where in zeeland where in zeeland is that Terneuzen. Terneuzen. Just, ah, uh, yeah, just been yeah. there i was just there Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I, well, yeah, it's because I we we went on a uh, autumn vacation uh, to Zeeuwslanderen, and ah. then it, you basically pass uh, Terneuzen. Uh, yeah, if you, and that's the best thing what you can do with it. Sorry for I all know. those who are living in Terneuzen. <laughs> you know, you know, it's just like. <laughs> yeah. But there was one big advantage over there, and that was uh, I was into sailing a lot. And wow, I yeah. sailed and surfed and did all kinds of stuff on the water, mm -hmm. and this is probably one of those other moments in my life that I discovered I'm a designer because I really could see after some time which, let's say, which uh, uh, sailing vessels, I don't know what to write, which boats, which boats were fast and would be nice to, to sail with if I just took, took, took a look at them on the shore. I could see already from the lines. Ah. like and, and what I really like about ships is that as a sailing uh, uh, sailing boats is that when they're beautiful they're very often are also uh, great to sail you can actually there's this there's something uh, magical about it and you see that with cars as well a little bit and planes and stuff like that i'm, I'm now just talking as a product yeah, designer yeah. yeah but there, there is we can see some aesthetics in things that are functional uh -huh. But not not in the classic form follows function, which is is very boring. Mm -hmm. It's it's a sailing vessel is a perfect example of how how something can be really nicely shaped, really nicely curved. You can take your your eyes around it. You can take a look at one of those lines, and you can see that it's that it's it's almost perfect. And then those boats, they will sail splendidly. And that's 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 one of those things that intrigue me. Can I? create those kind of things that look so nice and are so functional. This this is how I started as a product designer. But that was before the empathy part and stuff like that. All right. It reminds me a little bit of, uh, which is, I mean, yeah, it's a kind of a different different topic, I'm afraid, but it, but it does remind me of this. Um, uh, there's a, a, a film called uh, the, I think it's called The Beautiful Equation. And it's, uh, it's a, uh, to film a documentary about uh, someone who wants to discover whether um, if a an equation if it's if if it's if that can be beautiful or if it's only functions just numbers and and then and so there's all these famous uh, scientists that that they interview and all of them say if it's not beautiful it's probably not right. Yeah. So, so yeah. and for me that was like my brain went like Poof. yeah so they talk about aesthetics in an equation and you can tell because it's beautiful it is actually you, right and you so know the word Occ occam's razor no occam's razor that's that's in science mm -hmm. uh, a saying for that if you have 10 equations that explain something mm -hmm. pick the most elegant well, there you go. Yeah. Oh, there's a word. Well, no, yeah, but to me, so, so I, you know, I am a school dropout and I, because of my <laughs> dyslexia and all that. So for me, those moments, and I love learning, by the way. So that's not a, it's not learning disability, but I love learning. But for me, those like, those are moments where I, my brain went like, boom, like, so aesthetics and beauty and, 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 and emotion, even though it, it, these people who, who seem to be so extremely rational uh, but they're not, they're extremely emotional. It is about, it is also about beauty and about elegance and about, so to your point, uh, you can look at a very functional, you know, there's a boat and it's functional and you put some signs on it. You say, well, this is how water kind of flows and it is how, you know, so this, but actually it also creates beauty. Yeah. Yeah. 
and, can actually and, take a look at it and think, wow, this is just perfect. This curve, this if, and the more experienced yeah. you are, you better you can see it. That's 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 kind of weird, but there is this relation, and I yeah. really like it. So is that because is that because, and I'm I'm just making this up as I go along, but is this because uh, we are more part of nature than we like to kind of admit? because we are nature and because we are in, in, if we can be in tune with nature, we can maybe, so to your point with the boat, we know what we know, we feel water. We know how that feels. We know, we know nature, we know what wind feels like, we know what, what it is. And so if you're more in tune with sort of uh, with your surroundings and you, you're more observant and you're more in tune with your with your emotional side, uh, you will be able to kind of understand more about what works and what doesn't work and what, what fits and what doesn't fit, or what is an intervention, because you can also say, well, I'm gonna do something which is like the opposite. I'm gonna like like this weird shaped boat that we know it doesn't sell, but it's so ugly that it's kind of interesting again, because it's like an intervention into the system, right? Because I sometimes like those things, like, because I know there's like, there's this, like you have these cars, like these old Volvos, for instance, they're like you know, like a kid car it draws a car, but they're so like you know that they're gonna use a lot of uh, a lot of gas because they're they're you know, so, yeah, it's but just, they but they survive anything. That's that's how they look like. Yeah, again, yeah. right? So so there's yeah. Anyway, is there is there something like that you think that you? Well, I would I would I would uh, not just say nature. I, I would reframe it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say, uh, I don't know if you know the word, tacit knowledge, but mm -hmm. this, 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 mm -hmm. it's yeah. one of my favorite books in the, in the uh, uh, book uh, shelf behind me. Mm -hmm. It's from uh, Pol Polanyi, that's a philosopher from the 60s. And he said, we know more than we can say. Yes. And th the thing is, there is much of the things that we feel and, uh, and think that is basically embodied. And the most simple example I always give to, to students as well as I, I ask them, how, how is it possible that you don't drop off from your bike? And they can't, they can't articulate it. I give them 10 minutes, I give them 50 minutes, and still yeah. they're, they're guessing why they're not dropping off their bikes all the time. Exactly. Yeah. And then I say, just imagine, just, just sit here on this chair. Okay, st get away from, the, from, from, from your desk. Just sit on the chair. Imagine you're on a bike. Put your hands right now on this imaginary bike. Okay, you're there and they're doing it. And I say, okay, now you tend to drop to the left side. What is it what you're doing? And then they're looking at their own hands, uh -huh. at their own body. Uh -huh. and they see what they're, at, they're, what they're actually doing. They're suddenly steering automatically yeah, 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 to the yeah. left. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I start to explain. And this is what I say. The body in this case knows yeah. more. Than what we can say, yeah. and and with these ships and vessels and, and and cars, that's a little bit the same. Yes, we experience the world yeah. continuously. Yeah. We're only, I think, only five percent of it we can make sense of and verbalize. Yes, and the other ninety-five percent, there's so much wisdom in there and stuff in there that we can actually use. And yeah, if if you dare to access it dare to use your intuition yeah then you yeah. can become a really nice creative uh, designer yeah exactly so that's a really that's a really important point because what you're saying the language the words we have are often actually in our way if we if we if we if we say it has to be verbalized if you can't if you can't explain it you know then it doesn't mean anything or it doesn't exist exactly to your point that Sometimes we just don't have the words for it, but it doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not important, but you can't Hold describe it, it. Yeah, and and so I like the so the embodiment and and there's I think there's a whole um, and I I've been kind of so there's a, a there's a book about this um, uh, um, uh, and it's called A Man Without Words from by uh, Susan Scheller. And a man without words. Well, it's not exactly about this, but it kind of touches on this topic of language because, and, and the limitations of language because uh, it's a book about um, uh, Susan who meets a boy and she teaches sign language, but he doesn't know sign language and he's she's going to teach him sign language, um, but she discovers that he doesn't have any knowledge of words, and so how do you and 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 he's deaf. And I, so how do you teach someone words when you don't know words? And just that thought for me was like, what, if, what, how can you imagine you having no words, no words? It's still, 
It's still communicate with each other. Yeah, but and they communicated. Um, so he had f- sort of friends, a group of people who had the same uh, situation and the same condition, and so they would kind of uh, they would kind of uh, act things out when they wanted to share things. And he, so in the end, she she actually taught him a sign language. But one of the key things was that when they asked him, "What were you thinking before you had the words before you knew language?" he said, "I wasn't." <laughs> yeah, but but actually he was, but not yeah. no, but not but in a way that he knows now. Exactly, uh, he experienced it. And there's a TED talk. Uh, it's called "A Stroke of Insight," I think. And this is about uh, someone who gets a stroke, uh, a doctor, and and her language kind of center gets hit. And 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 she. It's an amazing talk because it's about language disappearing and what and how. Then all of a sudden. The world kind of just unfiltered comes in and it's she says like it's like being on drugs it's like amazing she was like whoa this is a so cool way. it's I not can, like well i, I, I can yeah. add i can add a very personal uh, touch to that because mm-hmm. i had a stroke a couple of them and i lost sight and i got partly sight back but mm-hmm. what i uh really like about this experience this sounds odd eh? because i'm still yeah, yeah, partly blind i'm i'm yeah. I'm, 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 I'm missing uh, 30% of my vision in the middle so that's quite hard uh, in the beginning um but what i learned and what i liked is that i could for some time observe my own sight because i could see what my brain was making from the part that was missing because it's not that when right. when you right. miss right. some part of it, I'm, I'm literally missing an area in my uh, in my view because it's in the brain. The, the eyes are perfect. It's just that the image is no longer composed completely. Exactly. So I'm missing a part. But the funny thing is, I could see for some time what my brains would make out of it because there is no black hole. You can't see a black hole. It's just they give some meaning to it. They 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 fill it in, and it was really funny in the beginning because. Uh, for instance, I was someone entered the door uh, and, and my room, and he came to me, and I was giving him a hand, and he was like, "What are you doing?" Oh, I thought you were giving me a hand because from something in the in the context, my mind. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I saw him giving me a hand, so I gave him my hand, but he was not actually giving his hand. So, and what I learned is that it took me two years, and, and not like exactly, but very slowly what my mind is predicting the missing parts are exactly. is, is getting better and better. And, and, and nowadays, 99% out of the 100 uh, cases, I do exactly what is needed. But still, it's possible that suddenly in that area, something is missing, yeah. uh, is standing, and then I just tip it over like if it's not there. But, but, what, it's, but you're, what you're experiencing then is like something I, I only read about uh, is – because you know when um, so when we work in 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 design and often we what we do is behavioral change really um, and we want and specifically we want to kind of have people think you know when we when we say think outside of the box for instance or if you we want people to do research and and observe and and um, we want them to get rid of their blind spots. And because your blind spot is basically your brain kind of predicting what will happen. And, and that's what you'll see. And the other things is just kind of filtered out. And it's like when you're in a room and you, you know, and this is, I just read about this stuff, obviously you're in a room um, and you know the room really well, if you, because it's your room, you've been there, your brain basically switches off. If you're, you know, you, 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 you know, you don't see it anymore. No. And that is such a it's such a such a important because it um, it it's that blind, it's sort of that spotlight as they call that uh, um, they you have your spotlight and how then do you get rid of that how do you then step out of that how do you say wait I have to switch off my spotlights so there's all these and I, I was speaking about this at a course I gave and it was a um, uh, there was a participant and he was he had been in the military. And he said uh, he ha- when he was on guard, and he he was uh, he was as a as a soldier who's been in uh, Afghanistan, and they had to, had to be on, uh, uh, guarding uh, the base, 
and for hours and hours. And they really had to have all these tricks to kind of uh, to make because they literally their, their brain would just switch off. And, you know, was there was there a tree there? I don't know. Is there, you know, <laughs> like, you know, so they had all these games to kind of make sure that they kept them, uh, their brain kind of switched on, really. Um, but in, in design and in, in research and, 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 and seeing out of sight of the box, and, and that is such an amazing thing. So I'm, it's almost like, so I can understand why you're saying that it's actually really interesting that it happened to you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that, but, and, and in a way, I'm, if you I'm look. Not, I, would, I would not recommend it. No, you're like, yeah, don't do that. That's awesome. No, no, no. Yeah. Don't, don't try to blind yourself. Uh, <laughs> just, just for the experience. That's, don't do this uh, at don't, home, kids. <laughs> don't do this at home. But, but yeah. in a way, what, what you're saying is, what I understand is, this is something that designers or design researchers should try to, to yeah. learn in a way. That's how can I look yeah. beyond my own, in my terms, frame. And so I have a frame with how I look at the world, and that's the spot, the, yeah. the, 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 the spotlight, spotlight, which you yeah. say. Yeah. And actually, I need to see more. And and yeah. what what I only can say is is that uh, there are there are two tricks. If if I can give recommendations, mm -hmm. the first one we just discussed: becoming aware of it. That's mm -hmm. that's the on the very moment that you're aware that you're looking at a specific way to whatever is in front of you that you mm -hmm. just. Why do I see? Uh, why why do I look at uh, uh, at you right now? And uh, am I looking most of all at the R and an A at the back? I don't know why. That the, the, the listeners can't see it, but he has some uh, yeah. some text behind him. But I'm I'm still wondering what R and A means. Uh, so, so that's uh, I don't know. But probably there's an A and an and no, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what's uh, what's uh, what's over there. <laughs> it's just an A and an R. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you're yeah, looking but at that and you're wondering, and that's, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because you be, try to become meaning to it. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is becoming aware of, of that you take a look yeah. at it. That's that's yeah. the most important thing because that it gives you a choice. Yeah. Yeah. To also say, okay, maybe I can look at it differently. And to make yeah. it very simple in psychological terms, uh, if I do an interview with someone, I can, of course, listen to him because I'm, have some list of interview questions and stuff like that, or I can just put down the interview questions and start listening to what he is saying mm -hmm. and whatever he comes up with, what happens mm -hmm. actually with you and me right now as well. Mm -hmm. We're just going to take that and we're going to listen to that and articulate mm -hmm. that because that's the only way to, to reframe what, whatever is in your mind that you are going to listen to the other. Right. That's, that's one way. And the other one is, is, um, and, and, and this is a bit philosophical, so I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. But um, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by uh, pragmatism. The yeah, American uh, John Dewey, Charles Pierce, uh, and, and one of them, William James, actually, and he, he started in a way psychology as well. But he's always saying that we experience a stream of consciousness. So things mm -hmm. are just going through us. Mm -hmm. and, and what we do as, as a human being, probably animals as well, by the way, but let's say as a human being, is that those we observe and see those things that are relevant for our well-being right now. So if I'm hungry, mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm walking through a, a street and I'm hungry, I see different things mm -hmm. yes. than when I need to go somewhere fast and I'm just trying to find a way to yes. get somewhere faster even than I'm biking right now. So I... Dependent on what is my uh, concerns, exactly. so what my well-being, I see yes. the world differently. Well, that's the that's the spotlight I mentioned. So, so that's what I that's what I said about. So, if you are uh, looking for a book on your on your, one of your shelves, and you think your book has a green cover, but it actually has a blue cover, you're not going to find it because oh. you can't see it because you're looking for for green. Uh, so your you, you know so your spotlight says green. And then, and then this is where you kind of, uh, you know, you 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 don't see your car keys or you don't see your whatever, because you 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 you're looking for something different and your brain doesn't doesn't see it. So that's sort of the, the so similar. Uh, if you, for instance, uh, if you, um, uh, I always had this like if I, um, um, for instance, uh, I don't know if you have a. 
for instance, if you buy a car and you think it's it's a car you've never seen, you know, it's a, nobody has that car and in that color. And once you buy it, you see it everywhere. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. You start seeing that exactly. Right. But so we it's can, like, but we can that, also reverse it, aren't it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if I still use the same pragmatism uh, as, mm-hmm. a, as, a, as a lead, eh? mm-hmm. what they say, and, and, and I really like this metaphor because it's so simple. They say uh, you have a mind which is in the background, mm-hmm. observing everything, mm-hmm. and you have a consciousness which is in the foreground, which puts the focus on something. Mm-hmm. And what happens is every now and then your mind will say, hey, consciousness, wake up. There's something important. And and this, this sounds really weird, but just imagine that you're driving in your car, your yeah. your, your blue car you just bought, yeah. <laughs> the new one that you start to see everywhere. Yeah. And, you're, and you're driving through a neighborhood yeah. and you don't see people and you're just driving there and you're talking on the phone with your wife and blah, 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 blah and you're driving a bit too fast. And suddenly, suddenly a ball bumps, bong. Bunk, yeah, yeah, bunk yeah, yeah, in yeah. front of you in the road. Yeah. Now, something happens because immediately you will stop talking to your wife. Yeah. Immediately you will scan for what's going on around you. Yeah. And uh, what what will you scan for, Anna? Kids. Kids, exactly. So yeah. the first thing is, is there a kid? Because you know yeah. there's a possibility, yeah. it's a hypothesis, that yeah. a kid will run on the road and trying to get the ball. Yes. Right in front of your car. Exactly. So the first thing you do is you're going to slow down. Yes. Where are the kids? Where are the kids? Yeah. Now, what happens is your mind took control and says to your conscious, yes. you need to deal with it right now. This, whatever yeah. happens. Yeah. Now, And why I like this story so much, I, I wrote a paper on it once uh, for teams, is surprises like the ball mm-hmm. are the benefits because those are the moments that we get new framings new ways of looking, suddenly I'm, I'm ripped out of my entire normal ways of thinking because of a surprise and I yeah. have to reconsider what is it that we're doing, where are we going and stuff like that. Now, if you want to be creative, organize the surprises. Yes. Exactly. Make sure that things happen that you will not expect and suddenly you become a very creative person. Yeah, but that's very scary. Do you have surprises? Yeah, yeah. I think that yes. makes you very because then you don't know what's going to happen. A surprise is something that is unexpected and you don't know what the outcome will be. Hey, so you, you amaze me, are there right now? You know, no. Because, because I, I, I tell this story more often. And I, what I noticed is if i explaining this to managers, they say, this is scary. Yes. If I, I say this to uh, young people, they say, we love surprises. Mm-hmm. Of course. <laughs> yeah. but I, I i i'm 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 speaking the mind of uh, sort of the my my sort of the the group of people that we try to convince that this is actually so important and this is what they will say they'll say uh, no surprises please i want no, to be in control you can't, plan, you can't plan for surprises Right. So I, I'm with you. I, I actually, I call those things interventions into, into, because I like, I like that because it kind of, I always say, throw a little pebble into the lake, a little stone into the lake and see what, what, what happens. And you don't know what's, what the, what, what comes back. But I like that because it's not about the stone I designed because it's, it's about the feedback I get. Yeah. And and then I can design another one and then I can design another one. Yeah. And, and, yeah. That, and that's, that's a creative process I like but it's not always something you can you're allowed to do in a business environment because people want to be in control or at least they they want to pretend that they are in control because they're really not but they want to pretend that they are in control uh by the language they use by sort of the um, uh the way they they guard sort of uh their processes and their protocols and all the like and if then you say let's organize the prizes and they're like uh, no so how do you deal with that how do you deal with those because i know you've experienced the corporate world you know and and uh and in the and, and in the yeah. academic world but how do you how do you how do you convince people oh you don't have to convince them and, and why I'm saying this is in, in different stages, let me put, let me put it like that. Eh? So, so if, if I'm always talking about innovation, about mm-hmm. doing new things and implementing mm-hmm. them successfully. Mm-hmm. And, and in, the, in, in specific stages, you have to organize for being resilient to whatever happens, what, what mm-hmm. you're saying, your stone. That's, mm-hmm. You have to do interventions to learn. Mm-hmm. And by the way, my, my, my shortest uh, 
definition of this design thinking is learning by creating. Mm-hmm. And, and what you're just saying is I'm learning by doing interventions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and by the way, uh, another one of my uh, real uh, all-time heroes uh, intellectually is Kurt Lewin, an American uh, uh, philosopher and action researcher. And he always said, if you want to understand the system, mm-hmm. try to change it. Yeah, exactly. That's the only way. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Only way. Well, that's that's part of a sort of uh, a complexity theory, right? So if if a system is too complex or, or chaotic, you have to create an intervention. Otherwise, you can't you can't analyze it. Nope. If you can't it's simple, analyze your way out. No, if it's simple, you can you can sit and analyze it and 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 map it out, and you can understand it. But but we are living in highly complex systems that are evolving at the same time, that you cannot analyze that. And no matter how much data you have, you cannot analyze it once you've done. And if you do, you know, once you're ready, it's changed anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're 30 you have, years, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? that, that's a little bit what happens with climate change right now. I'm a little bit afraid. After 30 years, we, we kind of have the, the right yeah. models. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thank yeah, you, really. I, I mean, we have yeah, the model, exactly. but no, but no solution. <laughs> yeah, this is what we should have done. <laughs> yeah. 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 We found it. We found the solution we should have had like 10 years ago. Oh, exactly. thank you very much. Yeah. No, exactly. So, so it's that that um, I think there is a a a, a more you know, I think it's also an evolution of, of our understanding, and, um, and and also because things are changing, also because of all the crises that we have, like climate change, uh, but also because of new developments around technology. And there's so many things that are so complex. And um, and I was reading uh, um, uh, the book *Sapiens*, uh, and, and it's um, and in the book there uh, uh, there's a there's a little uh, there's a chapter about the scientific revolution and how it was started by the simple acknowledgement that we don't know everything that is important and what we know might be wrong. And before that time, before we started thinking that way, we just simply said, everything that is important is, is in that book. It's in the Bible or it's in, or some king's head or, you know, some kind of ruler. And that's, everything that is important. Those are the laws that our king made or the God made or whatever. And then all of a sudden we said, well, actually uh, there are other things that are important we don't know. And we should, uh, interesting, we should find out or what we know might be wrong. So we kind of should keep testing the things that we do. And that sparked the scientific revolution that, and you know, that basically created the world as we know it, uh, you know, for good or bad, but still. But this idea of, um, I, we might be wrong, and uh, you know it's not about um, we can analyze everything and now we know everything and then we're done. No, <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, it's a, it's a continuous loop, a continuous iteration, and which somehow we forgot or somehow. So as an example, um, I, I've been working with this this big German company. Uh, and they and I, I mentioned this one because they had this wonderful name for their innovation departments and the people who were doing the innovation labs and all that. They call them their submarines <laughs> because, you know, if they, they had to kind of be hidden, uh, it was really important because otherwise the business would say they're just burning money. They don't know what they're doing because they're experimenting and they're failing and they're trying and, they're, you know, there's yeah. trial and error. That's what you that's how you learn. But they're but. And then if you think about how the business was started, like every other business, probably every other business started from entrepreneurial spirit, from, from tinkering, from trial and error. That's what the, that's what they're selling. Basically, they're, that's what their success was about. But then they, they kind of grew this whole kind of enormous giant of a company around it and they forgot. And you have to read, I'm literally reteaching people um, that that work so that that came from I worked for for a lot of uh, healthcare uh, uh, industry companies and people who worked in the laboratory doing tests um, now move into in management and then I have to tell them so how did you develop things when you were doing work in the lab right when when you were making when you tested something and you did a cl- clinical trial 
and it and and it and it didn't work and or you 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 it you know someone got ill or something didn't go or the mice died or something did someone get fired no of course not that was interesting data right so how come now you're you know in management position you totally forgot that that's how you learn things why is that and it's because of incentives and kpis and and and, and the likes yeah but but also on it is uh you need both worlds, and and why I'm saying this is, I, I kind of like those kind of people as well who are who are really like uh, this is the strategy and this is how we're gonna do it and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Okay. I'm I'm totally not one of them, mm-hmm. but I started to appreciate. Tell me, what, convince what, me, what, what convince you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I always start anecdotal, and this was uh, I, I really liked it. I uh, I was once I was I think 28 or something like that. Still very young, dear listeners, because <laughs> now I'm an old guy. No, but uh, uh, I uh, was talking to a director of an R and D, my own R and D, and what he said was, "Is we 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 had some problems, and uh, the, the kind of problems you're talking about. We had some surprises out there." Some machine was uh, went up in flames, and uh, what happened over there? Because yeah. you know, in it didn't happen in the United States, but if it would have happened in the United States, you would have a cl- claim that would be like like a million right. dollars and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, it was just in the Netherlands, so it's more like oh ships. But <laughs> what he but then he said something to me, which I think is crucial. He said, you know, the people who are working on innovation, on finding uh, uh, new things, approaches, that those are different people, mm-hmm. with different mindsets, mm-hmm. different processes, mm-hmm. and those people who are just trying to run the fabric, the, mm-hmm. the, the, not, not the fabric, the, the manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And this is a manufacturing problem, so we need different people than you. Sorry, Guido. But mm-hmm. if we send you over, you're gonna have a talk with them, and you're gonna discover all <laughs> kinds of nice things, and and this customer is really nice, and oh, you know, oh, you know what we can do with this, this, this burning things. Actually, I got a brilliant idea with it. No, no, sorry, Guido, you're not going there. We send someone over with a different mindset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, why I'm saying this is this is what I learned from him. Nowadays, we have a very nice scientific word for it. It's called ambidextrous organizations, organizations that can both run mm-hmm. efficiently a manufacturing and a service organization and stuff like that, mm-hmm. like the government should be able to do. Mm-hmm. And we have organiz- a part of the organization that can fail and try and stuff like that. And these things need to be a little bit separated from mm-hmm. from each other. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, if I if you would send me in for doing something which is very about efficiency and getting a hundred people as fast as possible their passports inside a uh, 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 what is it uh, when when they're applying for a passport and stuff like that and we mm-hmm. have to do it very efficiently and stuff like that mm-hmm. I'm not the right guy. Right. I'm not yeah. the right guy. I can yeah. think about it once how to do it better. Yeah. Same but, here. <laughs> yeah exactly but <laughs> On, on a, a Thursday next week, and we have another team with new people on it. How can we deal, deal with that from from the people who are uh, uh, yep. the, uh, offering the services? You need different kind of people. Yeah, but okay. So all right. So okay. So, I'll, so I'll grant the, you that one. Well, however, is do you feel that 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 balance between those two groups of people? isn't often kind of leaning towards the more structured, more linear kind of people, and that because and I'm and I and I'm not really sure if it's about being more uh, creative or you know not you know, less structured, but it's more about um, there's maybe more a balance of people who say yeah, but what it's what are we actually doing? Why are we doing this? And What's the point and who are we doing it for? Because I, I sometimes feel that the people who run the, the business in a very good way and, you know, and they're, they're, they have their kind of their talents there. So often kind of forget that um, there is there is more than just running a business and there is more than just kind of selling your product. There's also why are you selling that product or shouldn't you be, so, for instance, there is a, um, uh, uh, I, I, this is, I don't know the number here in Europe or in the Netherlands, but I, 
I was reading this article about uh, US where they did research on the happiness of, of employees. And I think it was about 90% of people in, in corporations are unhappy in their job. Now, to me, there's like, uh, yes, so you can be really efficient and really good at what you're doing in that business side. But if everyone's unhappy, what there's something going wrong. I am not saying that. I mean, there's, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to go to this idea that we have to kind of build an utopia. I mean, I, I wish we could. I don't think it's possible. We're human beings. We're, we are faulty. It's complex. Sure. I don't know. But it's, but there's something in my gut saying there is a more a bigger need than ever uh, to create meaningful business. And I'm saying that because I think that a lot of people like, and that it's not just young people, it's, it's people like me and like you who feel drawn to doing meaningful things. So if you have a talent in your company, um, nowadays, you know, HR companies struggle with keeping talent, retaining them for your company because, you know, they would rather work for a startup because it feels more meaningful to them either for the career because it's nicer because they're happier or they go to a company that has a sort of purpose. I don't know. Is, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that's, if you feel the same, but it might, I feel, I've been feeling that for a long time. And this is, I think why things like design thinking and, and, and that kind of IGL thinking is on the rise is there is something broken. There, it's, it's, there is something broken and, and we, I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't know. It's because it's highly complex but I think that there is something broken and we somehow have to play a part. We as human beings, not just us as creatives, as people out there to kind of somehow fix it or, or nudge it or show sort of a path forward. And, and I, I don't know, I, what's your feeling about that? Well, anyway, I, I recognize very much what you're saying. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I think, we're right in the middle of a tidal wave of, 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 and it's not just design thinking eh? so there's purpose economy and the donut economy, exactly. there's exactly. all exactly. these kind, all these kind of things that, that are in a way uh, with, with pointing the same direction. So we need to uh, revamp our paradigms of, uh, of, of how we think and what we think is most important and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, I, if, if I use the example you used yourself before, hey, you, you were talking about the book of Sapiens, you said something about science, that, mm -hmm. that was a major paradigm change, that mm -hmm. rather than saying whatever, who's in control is right, to saying, I doubt everything, because mm -hmm. I'm not sure about it until I can prove it. Mm -hmm. At, that's, that was a paradigm change. Now, mm -hmm. the paradigm change, this is a very personal sense, what I'm saying right now, but we have... Right now, we're in the middle of a paradigm, which is, which sorry for that, is called capitalism, which is mm -hmm. basically about efficiency, about mm -hmm. making money and stuff like that. And it's an excellent system. Mm -hmm. However, with every paradigm, there's always a drawback. There's always a pitfall and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we're all looking for changing it, adapting it, uh, maybe going to a new one. But at the same time, Anna, uh, I'm also aware that, for instance, the, 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 the paradigm you and I uh, are uh, uh, advocating all the time, design mm -hmm. thinking, be more creative. Yes, we have our own pitfalls as well. So, course, and, and, why yeah. I'm, and why I'm saying this is on the very moment that you make one paradigm, one way of looking dominant yes. inside a company, we all have to be very in KPIs and stuff like that. It's killing you. If you have an entire company just doing design thinking all the time, <laughs> they, they will go bankrupt anyway as well within a year. So, so, and the thing is, what I really like, and that's, that's this is this is this is what I would uh, like to tell the world, is together with these different paradigms and, and yes. respecting each other's paradigms and understanding which one is needed when. Yes. Then we can come a long way. On the moment we say the linear approach is better than all the others, then yes. then that's that's what we have right now. Then we're going wrong, and I'm saying the same sure. for the creative uh, paradigm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I could counter it by saying that is what design thinking to me is. It is about diversity. That's the whole thing. That's about, it's about curiosity and being open to other languages and being able to collaborate. It is exactly, we need to have diversity of thought, 
uh, and and so not just one, but 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 many. And I think diversity is is missing at the moment. Diversity of I thought, totally in, in, and and I think that's the key. And it's not design thinking, by the way. I know I'm kind of I'm part of this design thinking community movement and sort of. I never. I, I, it's not to me, it's absolutely not a religion. It's just a word, but it meant that it helped me stay close to what was changing. And, 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 you know, I called my company design thinkers by chance because nobody was talking about it at the time because this is like 15 years ago. Um, but, uh, but I, but it did uh, help me stay close to the change. And there's, and I, maybe now it's the time to let go of that. I, I, you know, I feel that because it becomes more of a, like a dominant force. And it, to your point, I always said, uh, once we have like, uh, you know, the, we, once we, uh, we, we, we finalize the sentence, design thinking is, and we agree on that, it's dead. <laughs> hey, right? remember that you and I were together in Milan? In 2009, for those who were not there, of course, but there was one speaker, if I remember well, and he actually said on the moment that we can all agree on a definition of design, yeah, it's that. It's that. Exactly. It's that. Yeah. It's the discussion, and it's yeah. the same for design thinking. On the moment yes. that we all agree this is design thinking, then yeah. it's that. Yeah. It's, it's gone it. and over. Yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I believe in that. And it, and it, and it's because it's the conversation, it's an ongoing conversation, it's discussion, because then it kills it. And, uh, and, then, and, it, and, then, and then it becomes static. And once it's static, it, it dies. And that's basically, you know, that's evolution. That's how it works. Then the, then the ecosystem around it is just yeah. not vital anymore. And But in um, a way, but in a way, uh, uh, but because, you know, I was, I was talking about pitfalls. And mm -hmm. there is also a pitfall in, in what we call design thinking. And, and one of those things, when the discussion is gone and we're just saying, this is it, and this is how you should do it, mm -hmm. what I observe right now, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, there's high burnout ri risk in, mm -hmm. in design thinking. When people for the first time in companies do it the, the creative way, the design thinking way, mm -hmm. and you stay with them, and I do, and you stay with them for a long time, what will happen is many of them will have burnout. And there is mm. this, there are very serious risks and and, and good reasons why, why, why is that? that why is that um because what you just say diversity yeah. that's 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 a nice word that that we all kind of love uh -huh. but it it also implies ambiguity and ambiguity yeah. is that we see the same things but we totally disagree yeah that's 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 what ambiguity is really is about. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I would just say take a look at, uh, at what's happening right now in the United States with the elections, and you mm -hmm. can see what uh, you can put anything on the table. Mm -hmm. You see totally different perspectives on it. Exactly. Now, if you accept that mm -hmm. as creative, that's very normal for people who are not used to that and who mm -hmm. like to have things clear and want to understand what the standards are, what is expected of them. Yes. So they don't. So people, most people feel much more confident when yeah. ambiguity is reduced. And if you can't yes. deal with ambiguity, you're, you're having a hard time with, uh, with yeah. innovation and design thinking. Yeah, exactly. So this is why we, we have, uh, you know, these models saying, uh, uh, design thinking here, it's four steps. No, it's six steps. So you go through these six exactly. steps. It starts at, yeah, you can yeah. put it in a box. You, you, know, yeah. and like, and you can't go back because we passed that already. Yeah. Well, right, actually, so. ac actually, going back is basically it. No, yeah. no, we passed it. Yeah. yeah that's like, that's, that's, oh, that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. When is it done? You know, yeah. never, never. That's, oh, yeah. God. You know, it's living yeah. in beta, living in beta. <laughs> like, oh, God. It sounds really cool, but. Yeah, no, I, I totally recognize what you're saying, um, and I and I, but I, what I would like to kind of add to it in my from my perspective is that we are just at the start, uh, and 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 somehow we feel as as and it's what we have been taught, I think, in our businesses, in our in our in our in our schools or in our cultures. I think I don't know where exactly where it comes from, but is that. We uh, are short-term thinking people, uh, especially in the in the West, uh, and also in the East nowadays. By the way, but it's that capitalism. I think is part of that. Is that I want 
my success in my lifetime and I want to experience it as quick as possible. And I want to be, you know, if you're not a, if you're not successful when you're 30 in your thirties or forties, you know, that's really sad because that's basically what you want and expect. I don't, I don't feel it as successful if I create something for the next generation that they might have the success or generations later. So I'm not, so it's from this idea of, um, uh, um, if I uh, have a family business, for instance, like like many German companies are, uh, you have a different way of thinking. You think about next generations, or if you and traditional or more like tr- um, like traditional Asian philosophy, and some uh, some Japanese companies have like a vision for the next hundred years. We can't imagine it. First, it's like no, I want my success now, and I do feel sometimes also because we are all part of that kind of drive in that 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 if we so we started with this service design and design thinking and then there's ux and the whole thing but i want to see sort of results now i want to be able to change those corporates i want to see that change i want to see my 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 but at the same time i also feel no we're at the start we just this is the this is the start and we should think about what do we leave and how do we educate next generation and what do we give the next generation so they can continue our kind of journey and and i said i think that's a I, i'm really interested in that kind of thinking of what what can i do so instead of me wanting to have a success and i wanted to have the i want to have this company go through this transition and i want to see the world change and what can i now build for next generation that they can actually build on that and and they leave it to the next generation, to the next generation. So it's this short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. And I think that, uh, I think we need that because I think that is more meaningful, but we, we but it's also uh, in a way telling me that we have to let go of certain things that we can also sometimes slow down a little bit and say, hey, so the back of your mind, it might be telling you this already, but sometimes you have to kind of, stop doing things we don't have language for it we don't have the mind wandering is the only word i can come up with that is sort of positive in the sense of otherwise it's just being lazy or procrastination or or doing nothing and but actually doing nothing and observing and seeing things uh, seeing patterns and understanding the consequences of what you do long term instead of just keep running and keep running and keep running and keep running because i need I need to I need to have my quarterly figures or I need to add whatever you know we're always running and and there's a contradiction in in that that we kind of feel that we always always have to keep moving because that's change and you can never step stop stand still and at the same time I feel that that we need to kind of calm yeah, slow should. down calm yeah. down stop doing stuff all the time it's okay your brain keeps working it won't stop still. It don't stand still. You can't even get it to shut up. <laughs> you know, it will keep working. But it. But if you don't stop, you're not listening to it. You're not listening to your your gut. Fe- and you know, we're going to come back to that 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 tacit knowledge again. You don't listen to your tacit knowledge. You have. You know so much more, but you have to. You know, you have to sometimes just stop. But now, but now here's the paradoxical situation, mm-hmm. and. I, I know you paint a lot eh, and, and draw a lot, correct? So, yes, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in a way, you organize yourself to do it slowly, to take a good look at what's happening in front of you and, and, mm-hmm. and, and to observe. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I know you uh, from a from long time ago that you were quite observant as well. So part, that's basically a bit what I recognize. Um, so th- this makes perfect sense for you, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, the, par- the paradox... What I see in in, in uh, uh, the topic we're discussing, design thinking, right now, mm-hmm. is that its promise and how it's very often used is design sprints and scrumming and agile oh. and running, 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 yeah. running, 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 quick, quick, quick yeah. solutions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and and, and why I <laughs> why I name this a paradox is because if you really go back to what where design thinking and the ideas arose from mm-hmm. from how what they observed they say it's a process of doing things and reflecting on them exactly creating and thinking 
uh, doing nothing basically. So yes. do something and stop. Yes. And listen. Because, and, yeah. Because without reflection, you can't learn. Yeah. And what happens? That's that's my uh, interpretation. In a way, uh, especially with this design sprints. This was the first time I started noticing that we had too many burnouts eh, in, in in design thinking kind of uh, schemes. Right. Yeah. It was always in design sprints. Yeah, yeah. People, of course. But they they did the first six weeks. They did the second th- six weeks, and then at the third period, they were like, "Damn, do we have to do it all again?" <laughs> you know, I need I need a holiday. No, no, no. We got a planning right now. We're gone with whatever. Eh? So so, but but the thing is. I always say uh, you go from A to B according to the laws of B. Mm-hmm. And what happens if if I put it like this, the, the laws of A are efficiency and speed up and doing it for the lowest cost possible. The laws of B are the creative laws, which implies failing, not doing things, take some time to draw a tree. I don't know why. I'm just I just feel I have to draw a tree. But at the end of drawing a tree, I got this magnificent idea i don't know where it came from but it happened yeah. that's the laws of b but what happened right now is that design thinking in many ways yeah. in in many cases and in many trainings as well sorry to say that for those who are into training of design thinking is basically done alongside the paradigm a so yes we like design thinking when it speeds up things when we don't stop when we do it faster than ever and there's got to be solutions whatever happens so if we go back to to, to star trek Correct. No, no, yeah. I'm no go sorry. back to Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. I no, I, because to me, what you're saying is, um, uh, in Star Trek, you have, uh, and for people who don't know Star Trek, because I, 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 I noticed that because I shared I, this thought before, and people are like Star, I don't know Star Trek, I'm like you don't know Star Trek. Anyway, uh, there is this very in if, basically if you're redesigning ships, the Borg. You yeah. remember the Borg? I mean, yeah, they, yeah, they, I they travel, in, they travel in a cubicle. Uh, talk about uh, spaceship design. They they have the cubicle, the box, and they assimilate everything that is not like them. So all you know. So to me, the the the, the company, the industries, the uh, uh, you know the corporates, they are the 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 pork. And then something new comes and says we have to do things differently. And they say, yeah, you come on in, and then you'll be assimilated. And then I go like, bing, bing, and you put, you get this chip in your head, and you go, boom, and you become half Borg, and then you, be, you know, you're assimilated, and you pop, you're fit into the box. I don't know if they meant it that way, <laughs> but I think it's not a, it's not a coincidence that it's a cubicle. It's a, it's literally a box, and you get put in back into the box again. I don't know if that's true, but but that's how I always feel. And there's a book called uh, you probably know it's because quite a, quite a, uh, an old book already. I think it's called um, Orbiting the Giant Hairball, and it's it's the idea was the idea of that you know the, the, the so the, the the company is the hairball, <laughs> and if you are an innovation, so back to the the idea of um, uh, the balance between innovation departments and. Uh, and 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 sort of the business is that you have to orbit it, but you, if you're too close, you get sucked into the hairball. And uh, or, but if you're too far away, get you know you get slung into the into the uh, into the the the, the um, universe and uh, get lost as well. So you have to kind of orbit it like just far away enough. I, enough I really like away. this metaphor. I really like this metaphor because this yeah. is this is what I personally experience as one of the most difficult parts. Mm-hmm. If if you get too close, you get a lot of attention, but you get burned. Yeah. Because they want to have results right yeah. now, and, and let, let's start with it. Yeah. And if you're too far out and you're doing great things, and, and probably you would say, I really like it what you're doing, yeah, then yeah, you yeah. don't get funded anymore because the company exactly. is like, this guy is gone. Yeah, he's he's like, really gone. You know, he's, he's, in, he's in outer <laughs> space somewhere. Yeah, he's yeah. somewhere out. Of, yeah, he's literally out of space right yeah, now. Yeah, so. exactly. And, yeah, and in exactly. A way, and in a way, this is a little bit a thin, a, a difficult balance because yeah. – I always say this is a balance like a knife on its side. Mm-hmm. You can balance it, mm-hmm. but it tips over immediately with the f- very first vibration or yeah. little dust dropping down, whatever, it right. will drop over. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's 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 making it so hard. So you know so when you when you were uh, observing those sail ships you know, so those boats and and uh, and then you you decided you wanted to be a designer cuz cuz or i don't think you as, as a child you didn't call it being a designer but when did you when what, so did you cuz you went to design school to which school yeah. did you go to 
uh, Technical University of Delft. Yes, the, industrial I design. Think the most famous one here from the Netherlands, at least to me, my to my knowledge, that's where all the uh, the smart people come from. In my well, I live nowadays in Eindhoven, so and there are very <laughs> few educations in Eindhoven. So if I just say yes right now, then then, then I can't live here anymore. It's it's one of those great institutions. It's one of those great institutions. <laughs> yeah. Well, now for me, if I if I if I um, so if I would hire someone and and they I don't care about their their resumes at all. I don't I, I care about who they are at the moment and, and what kind of people they are. But if it says Technical University Delft, there's always a little light bulb goes up. Hey, that's interesting because they learn how to think in a very different way that is very fits really well with what we do. Um, so I, I'm really, uh, if I, I didn't go to that school because I have just like, I'm a school dropout, as I mentioned, uh, but I went to, I, I, I taught a class once at, uh, at the school in Delft. And I, I, I remember walking in for one of the first times and I thought if they would have had this kind of school when I was a kid, the way it was at that time. And at that time they had all the machines out in the main hall. And so they changed that. But at that time it was all there. It was all visual. And I thought, whoa, I, I would have loved to go to this. Baker's culture. Yeah, it's like amazing. Yeah. Anyway, but you went there and and um, and and how did, is that where you kind of discovered or, or why did you go there? Why did you decide to go there? What was, what was the draw? You said yes. I'm going. I, to I can make I can make a very poetic and nice philosophical uh -huh. uh, thing, but actually it was it was quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't go there at first. Okay. <laughs> I studied maritime technologies. I uh -huh. wanted to become yes. a designer of boats. Yes. Yes. And they sense. had these the, these great uh, kind of basins where they have these these uh, American Cup kind of races. They were pulling uh -huh. through on the open day, and I was like, "This is my life. This is where I want to be. This uh -huh. is this is exactly what I, I I I'm dreaming of." So I went there, and then we did a lot of math, we did a lot of mechanics, and we did a lot of physics, but we didn't do any designing. And I never saw those boats again after one uh -huh. year. So I got so I got my first year. Uh, proper Duits on Dutch, yeah. and I was like, I went to a professor, and 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 uh, I'm, I've always sorry, uh, quite opposite to you. I'm not a high school dropout. I'm more the kind of guy who's who's always trying to get great grades and stuff like that. No, don't be sorry. <laughs> oh no, it's it's just Very yeah. Well so done. I was I, I finished my first year in June, and I was like, I, I went to a professor. Uh -huh. And uh, I asked him, when do, will I start doing design? Because I didn't like my first year, to be honest. And he and I really liked him. He said, you won't. Uh -huh. He said, to be honest, that was a little bit part of the... the, the and, and maybe maybe one of you, of all those people who are now in the first year, one of you maybe will become a designer, but all the others will become engineers. Right. So that's what was happened. And at the same time, there was this uh, school of industrial design in Delft, and they had exactly what you said. They had this 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 hallway basically filled with machines and devices yeah. and stuff like that. Fantastic. That was one thing, and there was another thing which was really interesting to me, which I didn't understand, because I was spending, I would say, ten hours of studying and forty hours of having fun, and they were having forty hours of working damn hard. Mm -hmm. And 10 hours of having fun. And for some reason, I was like, that sounds like a real proper study to me. Right. Because rather than just studying books, mm -hmm. they were making things. This is something I can explain yeah. right now in, 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 in hindsight. And that takes much more time, mm -hmm. guys. It's much easier to learn from a book, I always say, mm -hmm. than trying to write your own one, which basically is designing. Yeah, exactly. And and and, and I was attracted to that. So I, you know, I just I just moved on. I didn't know what industrial design was, but at least they're they're making things. At least that's that was a good thing. And uh, and then I discovered that what I liked is that they put people centerpiece. It's it's very uh, human centered. Mm -hmm. So I learned product design. I, I and from then on, it it's uh, uh, I learned many more things: interaction design, interface design, service design, and so on. Not not just on the school, but later in my career. And I moved back because I still. I, when I started with it, but I still have the same feeling is that their idea of how innovation works mm -hmm. is rather technocratic, is rather right, rational. So that's that's the downside for all those who yeah, now yeah. think like, I want to study there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it is design thinking the way engineers think design thinking is about. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. people are most important, so we put them central, we're mm-hmm. going to study them. Yeah. What, what I'm missing right now a bit, and probably you as a school dropout did that much more than I did, is what, we, what I call artistic research. Mm-hmm. Just make things in order to learn, to see, and, and that's something you don't learn in Delft. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but you, but anyway, uh, oh, yeah, no, no, no. It's it's. It, I think it's a. Uh, it's. I think it's important because this is where we teach new generations. Um, you know how to basically how to think in a way. You know you're being brainwashed, right? So you're being programmed. Your brain's going to be kind of like because I I can tell when people have done uh, Delft. I, I, you know, I mean. It's not like they can do blind tests, like talk to me for five minutes. And I know it's cool you went to, but I can tell in the way they think. And and it has an amazing benefit because they are really good critical thinkers. And they are people. So just one la- last anecdote about Delft is that I've been teaching a lot of schools and, um, uh, you know, and I and I usually, you know, like a guest uh, 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 lecturer. And uh, m- most of the time, I do a lecture and then I, I say, okay, any questions and no questions. And students are like, yeah, whatever, maybe one or two in Delft before I started talking, they had questions and they went yeah. like, can I ask you a question? I'm like, what's going on? Like what? Oh, this is I, awesome. I, I, can, I, can I open my, my presentation first before yeah, you start yeah. asking questions? Yeah. yeah. So I love that. I love the, the, it was a different, uh, very different way of, also because it's an international school and, and, you know, people kind of are there to really get the most out of the school. And then maybe it has something to do with the, the work they do through they work hard. Um, but I, I like that. I, I, that's a, uh, that was, oh, I, I like it. Yeah. I like it as well, but I, I, I genuinely believe and to be honest, I, I'm back as a, a professor of applied science right now in another school in, in Holland, in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. And we're working closely together with other uh, professors. Mm-hmm. I really believe that we need a new kind of design thinking education, mm-hmm. and which is not, we can learn a lot from Delft, but there are some things missing. And uh, we, we are really redevising what education should look like for Developing design thinkers for 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 twenty uh, twenty uh, six uh, something like that. And so, what should it look like? Well, one of the most important things is is uh, we, we were talking before about different frames, different perspectives. Mm-hmm. Well, the implication is in education that they need to work multidisciplinary. So you need to pe- put people in, young people who mm-hmm. did two years of, of uh, what is it, software coding and stuff like that, together with people who worked on uh, in, in uh, on nursing and stuff like that, together with people who are into creative business, together with people who are working on mechanics and stuff like that. Right. They have to come together in a team. Mm-hmm. Then they discover something really weird that these people are, are nuts. They think very, very strange and then mm-hmm. discover that actually together they can come up with ideas that are really, really, really nice. Sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes great solutions. Sometimes it, it's a total fill. It doesn't matter, but they have to learn mm-hmm. that they are having different frames, different perspective, different knowledge. And right. and, and that, that's one of the first things that I think is really important. And the second thing is, is, is this, well, and this is basically design thinking, but in the Netherlands, beyond design education, there are many schools right now who say we need to have design-based education, mm-hmm. also for physiotherapists, I'd like that. Nice. So, yeah, yes. So this is much wider than just wow. design education. For instance, Stenden Hogeschool is is completely changed everything. They say every course we do is design-based, mm-hmm. design thinking-based, mm-hmm. and not, we're not that far at in Holland, but we're we're going there as well. What we say is every professional regardless whether he's studying physiotherapy or he's, he's studying creative business or he's studying communication or he's studying uh, software, it doesn't matter. They have to learn to think critical and they have to learn how to design because that's the only way in your own professional practice later on how you can come up with great ideas to solve a problem. You can't analyze your way out, to quote you yourself, Arne, what you said before. Yeah. So if we just teach mm-hmm. them how to analyze 
they will try to analyze the way out. We teach them that they can analyze and you can have to design and create and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And possibly we develop a new generation of, of professionals who for whatever problem there pops up, the first thing they will do is like, I need other people around me, diversity. Mm -hmm. And you know what? This sounds like innovation. Maybe we shouldn't try to analyze. Maybe we should try to make things first. Mm -hmm. But this is this is where we're amidst of, of this change in 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 uh, education in the Netherlands. Right. Higher so, education. So I I yeah I understand. Um, I think that what that what, you know one of the things that I think should be solved and will be solved maybe not completely by but will be solved by this is that now and and it's being sort of i think when the whole movement around surface design started in in, in europe it, it what also happened is that all of a sudden we were expecting certain people designers or creatives to be superhuman beings like they could do everything they can be researchers they could be graphic designers they could be you know data visualizers they could be uh, uh, strategic people they could be facilitators they could be everything whereas uh, so the, and then they said oh that's called a service designer or something which is something i've never understood what that was because what exactly are you but what what i do feel is that um what you so it's a team effort it's 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 actually you have to get to these people together and they have to be able to collaborate together and understand that it's better together <laughs> basically um however there's no other way isn't yeah, it? no, exactly. And it's, there is no other. complex for any single mind. It yes. doesn't matter what kind of, how, how smart you are, you can't solve it on your own. Exactly. And yeah. that's, that's the first thing we need to teach young people. Yes. Whatever you do, if the, uh, the it's a complex problem, get a team together. Exactly. But is it is it then also a specific skill to get that team together? So, I, you know, this is great of a leadership podcast. <laughs> and in my, in my, and I'm not saying talking about hierarchy, but I'm talking about self leadership and it is sort of a leadership quality in each and every one of us. And not sort of this, uh, so you are really good at one kind of specific topic, but you also have a leadership quality. And we need to kind of understand that you have to create this safe space, psychological safe space for people to actually work together, but also. To have those comp, because I, I like the, the fact that you kind of just mentioned you know, these conflicts that you can have, because these conflicts are just as important as as uh, in the creative process as you know it being smooth and happy and everybody's fantastic and agreeing. Disagreement, you know, uh, is, is of innovation. Yes, of course it is because it, because it, if I always say if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. So. No, and my my, my uh, similar approach is uh, I always say those teams who are happy clappy getting to the end they never win the competition exactly it yeah. is those teams that are yeah. fighting and ah. have arguments and disagree on anything but in the end come up with something they agree on that's those are the well guys. and that is but again in a way that's almost common knowledge that you you know it, it, this is the the forming storming norming and performing kind of uh, yeah. process yeah. right is that if you survive your storming moment you know <laughs> if you're if you survive the argument and you can truly get together uh you can then really start performing but uh but it's 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 the the courage and the and the and the sort of the knowledge of of where where are you and how it, that, that 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 tension is okay, and that and disagreement is okay, but create that space so someone needs to allow those spaces. Because if those students go to any business now, uh, and they say, "Yeah, I, you know," they try to apply it, they don't get that environment where they can actually, uh, 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 you know, practice that. Now, I know there's a lot of agile companies at the moment. They're, they're changing, changing into these agile models where they work in tribes and squads and, and, and the likes. And if you are like in it, and if you're right, so if you are in a tribe, you, you are almost, you know, you can, you're a self-sufficient team. You're very independently making your decisions. Now that's in, 
to be quite honest, maybe a little bit cynical. Many, most companies, that's just language and people are com- totally confused because nothing really changed. They're still Monday morning, go to, ba- go to work and, you know, sit by and they're like, I'm in the tribe now. What do I do? I don't know. Um, so, but uh, that's my experience working with some agile companies. Uh, but it's just, again, it is the start. It's, you know, it's just the start. We just started doing these things. So it's also amazing that these companies are there and they're doing this because it's part of this evolution and, and we're seeing it. Just the acknowledgement that we have to be agile, that we have to do this uh, or reorganize ourselves is, is great. But these students, I'm just really worried about them in the sense that we need to kind of then also make sure that th- will they end up in a, an environment where they are able to kind of use those skills uh, or will they become very cynical and i'm saying that because i've been to your point also the you know the, when you talked about the burnouts when you know i've been teaching people who are for instance in sales and they went through this design thinking uh a course uh, because they had to because their boss told it they just had to have the certificate basically and uh, and they went through the training and they all knew like we can't apply it because pff, you know no way i can do this uh, you know in my company so they actually became a little bit more frustrated because they understood the value of i mean these smart people so they got it it's just that how do you make sure that where do they go where are, do you feel that companies are changing do yeah, yeah they, definitely yeah Definitely. But the thing is, uh, Arne, um, we're talking about paradigm change again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and another uh, one of those famous books I, I, I read, Thomas Kuhn, uh, it's about where the words paradigm change comes from. And what he says, and I'm going to make it very simple, uh, he, he does as well, by the way. We, we kind of look back at those paradigm changing moments as if it was like that, like spot on, just overnight, it happened. And he uses this famous example of the the, the, the the Earth orbiting the Sun or the Sun orbiting the Earth. Uh, that's uh, Copernicus. He says, you know, Copernicus took a long time to write it. He didn't publish it when he was alive because he knew he would be killed or uh, he, <laughs> he would be in trouble. Mm-hmm. And even when it was published, it took them another 80 years, 80 years, 80 years <laughs> before it was considered the most appropriate theory to explain what's going on and and, and what i like about that book mm-hmm. is that he says that that he describes the process of how paradigms change he says first there are anom- anom- well that's a difficult word anomalies so small ruptures that we cannot explain anymore things right. are going wrong mm-hmm. at first we ignore them after some time we try to explain them with very weird kind of theories then sometimes someone comes up with another theory which explains the small ruptures but can't explain all the other things. Mm -hmm. Basically, the discussion you and I just had because, Mm -hmm. yes, efficiency is needed as well every now and then Mm -hmm. and and design Mm -hmm. thinking can't deal with that. But we're we're part of a paradigm change. Mm -hmm. In the end, someone will come up with another bigger paradigm bigger than the control and capitalism and efficiency paradigm we're in right now, but it's going to take a long time. Maybe it's the donut economy. Maybe, I don't know yet. Maybe, I don't know which one it is. The purpose, I don't know which one it is, but it's going to take 20, 30, 40 years. That's, yes. that's basically it. Exactly. And and, right. and we're right in the middle of it. Yeah. And, and what I like is it, it's going to take 30, 40 years, but fortunately I'm on, on the side that we're moving to. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, and now I'm saying something that maybe is not so good for the podcast, but I'm very happy. I'm not part of uh, the the big oil companies or uh, stuff like that. Who are always very big and and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They're going down very slowly. They're going down. That's really yeah. funny to see. Yeah. They changed their. They didn't change their paradigm. They didn't went along with what is happening. Yeah. And uh, it's it's just an example. But Exxon is uh, Exxon one of those big uh, oil companies is mm-hmm. dropped out from the what is it the the biggest uh, uh, index uh, economy index of right. the world because right. they're not so important anymore yeah exactly they lose their relevancy completely yeah yeah, yeah exactly so which is you know so there's yeah, yeah so, so i <laughs> yeah no go ahead. it was it was a detour sorry but what i'm saying yeah, is yeah. i ra- i rather be part of a movement that tries to develop students yeah. who are used to ambiguity, who are used to working in teams, who mm-hmm. know that it's hard. They mm-hmm. understand that it's it's going to take creativity to get 
a problem solved rather than just being very analytical. And yes, sometimes some of them will be very disappointed in real life for the time being. But that's the only way how we can move on, how we can change. Yeah, that that's uh, that's that's very true. I um, I want to talk a little bit about something you just shared before we uh, started recording, um, because um, because when you you started writing your book, uh, um, and I thought it was a really powerful story because it, it had because it um, uh, because you had a small well you had a series of small strokes well actually quite big ones oh yeah also big ones okay yeah um and can you can you retell that story because i thought it was such a powerful story um oh okay right? okay so, yeah that's that's yeah the thing is the thing is i never had time <laughs> yeah to write a book and and stuff like that because i was yeah. always moving forward typical for design thinking rushing <laughs> going yeah, forward yeah, yeah. Then I had a series of strokes, indeed, and yeah. uh, serious strokes and uh, risky strokes. And then at one moment in time, I lost my uh, eyesight first yeah. completely and it slowly got back. Mm -hmm. But from 80% loss up till 30% took two years. And the thing was, I could not read anymore and, and stuff like that. So it was a little bit weird situation. Mm -hmm. To say the least. Said. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe the weirdest part was is that I was not concerned, but everyone around me was a lot. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can imagine. It. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, because when it when it concerns yourself, at least that's that's for me. Yeah. You're a bit more like, okay, this is the new situation. Mm -hmm. So how I move on, I don't know yet. And but the funny thing was is, and, and I think you're referring to that is, I need to learn to type blindly and stuff like that in order mm. to be able to communicate and stuff like that. And, 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 and then I had to write all these boring uh, stuff because they, they, they just gave me something like, uh, uh, like a podcast basically. And I had to type it out <laughs> blindly. And I was like, I, can oh, I do could that. have used you. <laughs> Actually, yes, yes, yes. By then, you could have used me. I was transcribing stuff, and uh, yeah. But actually, I'm, I'm I'm a creative, so I was a bit more like, is it okay if I start writing a book? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so during my that that period, I I started to write the book on design thinking. It's Dutch, by the way. Unfortunately, for the others who are listening to it who are not Dutch. And I could finish it for, I think, uh, 60, 70 percent already. Then I sent it to a couple of publishers and they were all very interested. And uh, so so it, it, it became a bestseller in the Netherlands. But the thing is, even then, maybe that's the reason why you liked it. No, why did you like it? Well, I like it because um, it is it, it has something to do uh, with um, something we talked about early. I think we weren't recording there, too. You said... Um, so I do this podcast as part of a uh, research into into creative people and people who are, um, uh, you know, I, I, all of you, all of them are in a way change makers or they. Um, but so I, I told you about uh, an interview I did with uh, Gordon uh, Domza and where he had, you know, certain, certain things happen and they're coincidental. But you said, yeah, but he picks up on it. He yeah, recognizes yeah. it. He, yeah. he he takes that opportunity as an opportunity, yeah. and and a way that's what you did. You can you you didn't go like all right, I'll do this. You said, well, I can create something. So there's this somehow there is a creative energy in you that says that makes total sense for you to then start writing a book in a situation where most people would go like, that's not what you started writing a book when <laughs> like when you yeah. couldn't write anymore. Yeah, so. I thought it was a really interesting, um, uh, it's almost symbolic for what you were describing. I, I'm dealing with, uh, with uh, in a way, this is uh, resilience. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, resilience. On a personal level. Uh, so so I, I had to deal with this and I, th I was a bit like, and I'm just saying it as if I knew what I was doing. No, it was not like that. Mm -hmm. in, in, in insight, I can say, it, it sounds like resilience. And yes, it was turning something bad into something good. That's all in hindsight. Yeah. You know what happened at the time being? I was just bored, you know, bored, bored yeah, to yeah, death. Yeah. Transcribing. You know what? Can I just 
come up with my own stuff and then you read it and then you say uh, if I did it well or not and then oh yeah that's that's an also a uh, possibility and yeah. then it happens so in hindsight we can explain each other the stories yeah. why we did something on the moment yeah. itself you have to trust your gut feeling exactly yeah but exactly so you you don't have you know it, because that also tells you that you don't have to know why you're doing things the way yeah. you're doing just you know you, it's okay to kind of not know that but you trust explore, your explore the explore the not knowing exactly so i think that's really powerful and um for the dutch i mean will it be translated why i mean you, uh th th this question has been asked so often that maybe i should make some work out of it it will be translated all right probably yeah, now the, the thing is probably i need another stroke before i actually do something <laughs> like that because because this is boring for me you understand? No, you don't have to personally, it's boring. If you don't have to translate it yourself, you have publishers who can help you with that. You can just have it translated. Yeah, That's but then not... it's still, still, it needs mental. Yeah, effort. I know, I know, you of need course. To go there to check the words and us. But anyway, that's well, yes. But if it's yes, it's going to be translated. It's going to be translated. But that's when it's translated in English. If it's translated in Chinese, you can't, you can't do anything anyway. You don't know what it says. So. No, but <laughs> probably we're going to have a second edition. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we, I don't know where. So for the Dutch people, what's the title, and where do where can they get it? I, I, it's it's design thinking, radical veranderen in kleine stappen, mm -hmm. and it's 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 quite a bestseller. It it it, uh, it was best management book of the year in 2018. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's 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 easy to find. Don't okay. worry about it. If you type right. in design thinking books, then then you're there already in the Netherlands. Okay. Right. Um, for the English listeners. What I focus on most of it, that's the subtitle, Radical Change in Small Steps. And that's basically what I think that we're talking about on yeah. and on and on in, in, in different ways. Is you People believe that we need leaders with great visionaries. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the reality, it's much more about trusting your guts, doing a small step, testing it. No, it's not working out. Doing something else. No, it's not working out. Testing it again. Hey. This looks like something like a nice idea. Maybe you should go on to that and on and on and on. And, and you know, th the funny thing is I wrote it most of all for students. Mm -hmm. and it became a management book of the year, mm -hmm. which was really hilarious. I was explaining it to the jury in front of the audience. I didn't write it for you guys. <laughs> 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 but but here's, here's the nice part of it, Anna. And that's... You, 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 I kind of hear you say again and again that, that managers don't understand yet, corporates don't understand yet, but they decide that this is the book they like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, I'm hopeful for the people. So, I'm, so it's, I, I think, yeah, so I, I, and I see that and I understand it because I, I, I think the individuals, the people, in these corporates and those managers, these are really smart people. They, they, I mean, I'm not smarter than they are. They, they see it, they know, they know it. It's, it's the systemic problem it's it's a, we're in a systemic problem and that is it the is. and that's it and it's and we're caught in that we're all caught in that it's not because one one group is smarter than the other group no at all not at all so i i think we're in a systemic problem and and again we're going back to complexity and to your point we change it because of these small steps so i think you're the answer to to the complexity that you're describing, I, I, you know, totally understand why people kind of want to know that and want to kind of follow that route because it's a, it's the only possible way because you cannot change that system like you know at once. There's no way you have to take small steps. So it's so logical, and we need people to tell us how. How do we do it? What what are those small yeah. steps? And give us confidence, you know, yeah. to that that is the way. So I, I I totally see why your book is so relevant and and your message is so relevant. So um, by the way, a small story, not from my book, but from another uh, one of those great authors I like, uh, and he actually stole it. It's this is this is the funny part of it, but <laughs> forget about that. It's Carl Wake, and he is mm -hmm. about sense making and stuff like that. And he has this story in one of his books, and he says. There was this uh, battalion of soldiers in the Second World War. They were German, by the way. So for those who, who think now that, that it, it's just what happened, he, he writes it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they were German. But they were stuck in, in the Alps, in the snow, in the evening. It was They were, they were lost. They were stuck in the snow. And it's, the snow was dropping down. It was getting colder and colder. And they knew that if they, they were in deep shit, to put it mildly. 
So they had to stay there in the night. They were freezing to death. And the next day, everything was white. They didn't know what to do and stuff like that. So what shall we do? Stick and whatever. Then someone discovered he has a map in his back. back. And they take the map. They take a look around. They started walking through the snow. And when the snow is melting a little bit, they find their way back. And they come back to the base camp. Now, the funny thing is, the map he had turned out to be of another mountain area, the Pyrenees. I don't know what the English word is. Pyrenees. This, the Pyrenees, I don't know what it is. But he had the wrong map. But the point is that, that this guy was making, uh-huh. start moving, because when you move, yeah. you will discover your way. Yeah. Exactly. That's, and that's, that's, that's radical verandering, kleine stop, radical change in small steps. Start moving, guys. If you want to have systemic change, start moving. Don't try to ch- change the system all at once. Just start moving and find your way in between the, the, the ongoing. Yeah. And one thing is for sure, whatever design you have with you, whatever map you take along with you, it's the wrong one. Exactly. So if, yeah. yeah. That's, that's interesting. That's really good. It, it, that, uh, that brings me back to um, a story from Sapiens about maps and where it describes that in the 14th and 15th century, they had world maps that were all filled in, no blank spaces, no open spaces. It all, when they didn't know what was out there, they put some monsters there or something, right? And then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this, you know, again, back to that idea of we, it's okay not to know uh, because, you know, uh, that's actually really interesting. Uh, maps appeared with... Uh, open spaces just they just put in what they knew and the rest was open and that sparked curiosity and people would go find out what's out there even if it killed them they would go and sail into those uh, areas so it's this kind of interesting uh again balance between uh, uh it's okay you know um you can't you don't know everything it's okay don't pretend you know everything but these open spaces are okay, and you go venture venture into it and and uh, and start. Uh, the, the, you know, the map is broken. It's not a good map. It's because it's just partly filled in. We have no clue what's out there, but it, but it allows you to move. It allows you to go places. Like yeah. you know, it's it's uh, fill in the blank. Try to fill it in. That's yeah. the wonder. Yeah, exactly. And I, I that's that's uh, that's that's really cool. So I I love that story. Um, thank you for sharing that. And it was a good way also to uh, to end uh, with uh, you know, the podcast because of uh, that kind of good advice, uh, very 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 relevant. And uh, um, yeah, so thank you very much for for uh, being a guest on this show. Uh, I uh, I enjoyed that, and it's good to kind of because it's been quite a few years since we talked, so I I enjoyed that. Apparently, we're still we're still on the same walk together. That's yes. the funny thing. We can yeah. walk we, we can walk the same the different things, but we're still on the same route. Yeah, which is uh, nice. It's funny. That's nice yeah. to know. All right. Thank yeah. you very much for interviewing. 